Ethicists, welcome back. Today we're talking about chapter four of James Rachel's The Elements of Morality. And chapter four is entitled, Does Morality Depend on Religion? So we're going to run into a number of historical uh, figures, a number of philosophers in this chapter, from Socrates to Plato to St. Saint Augustine, St. Saint Thomas Aquinas, and uh, more, more recent Thomas, or sorry, more recent David Hume. Um, but we care less about who's saying what and more about what they're saying. So the first uh, theory that the chapter covers here is divine command theory. So on divine command theory, God decides what is right and wrong. Actions that God commands are morally required. Actions that God forbids are morally wrong, and all other actions are permissible. So if you can find evidence that God said something's uh, wrong, then um, that's wrong to do. If you can find evidence that he said uh, that it's right, then that's the right thing to do. And um, if there is, if he doesn't say anything one way or the other, then it's okay to do, but not required of you to do. So there are some attractive features of this theory of morality. First, it makes morality perfectly objective. Um, there's very clear guidance, uh, well, perhaps. Uh, there are very clear standards for when something is right or wrong. If God commands it, required. If God uh, forbids it, then forbidden. Uh, and if neither, then permissible. Second, it motivates us to be moral with the threat of punishment. So why should we be morally good? Because if we're not, then come judgment day, uh, we're going to have a very bad time. And sometimes people need an extra uh, prodding to do the right thing. So uh, built into this theory uh, and, uh, and many in the cosmology of, of many religions and the doctrines and dogmas of many religions is uh, some uh, prodding to be moral. So some uh, problems with this theory, it won't motivate atheists. So if this atheist would have, if this is the correct theory of morality, then atheists would have no reason to be morally good, uh, not believing in God. In fact, an atheist, even worse, an atheist could believe this theory. They could believe that uh, actions are only morally good if, actions are morally good if and only if God commands them. Actions are morally wrong if and only if God forbids them and they're permissible otherwise, um, but think that God doesn't exist. So therefore, nothing would be right or wrong for the atheist. That's uh, potentially problematic. Um Another bigger problem here, the one that we're going to spend a good amount of time talking about here, is the Euthyphro dilemma. So Euthyphro was a um, dialogue written by Plato. Plato's teacher was Socrates. In the dialogue, Socrates, the main character, is talking to Euthyphro um, about divine command theory. So Socrates asks the question, is conduct right because God commands it, or does God command the conduct because it is right? So note the, the causation here. So is, some, is the right thing to do, is it the right thing to do because God tells us that it is, because he commands us to do it, or does he command it because it is right? Now, this is called a dilemma because Socrates thought that neither answer, answer to this question would be acceptable to theists. So one way we might try to answer the question is right conduct is right just because God commands it and for no other reason. There are a number of problems with this. First of all, it makes uh, morality very mysterious. It's easy to um, talk about how to uh, make a house, right? You build the walls, you put a roof on top, you got a house, uh, something like that. Right? Um, it's not so easy to talk about how a being could make something morally good. How does somebody like 
breathe into an action the quality of moral goodness or moral badness. Uh, it would be super mysterious to us. Now, maybe theists aren't so concerned with that. They might um, think that God's ways are ultimately mysterious and, you know, we shouldn't question them, right? A bigger problem here is this conception of morality makes God's commands arbitrary and makes claims about his goodness completely unintelligible. So how does it make God's commands arbitrary? Well, imagine if the only way an action becomes good or bad is by God making it so. Well, that means that nothing was good or bad before God made it so. So there were just actions. And they had qualities, but none of them were good or bad making qualities. And then God just picked a few and said, these are the good ones and these are the bad ones. Why? Well, he couldn't have done it based on a reason. Because if he commanded us to, if he uh, made his decisions based on a reason, then he would be commanding it because it's right. But that's the other option of this dilemma. So we're sticking with this first one. Right conduct is right because God commands it. If right conduct is right only because God commands it, then he had no sufficient reason for, for saying that some actions were right instead of others. Um, nothing was right or wrong before he made it so. And then what he commands is arbitrary here. He could have said um, honesty was morally good. He could have said honesty was morally bad. He could have said uh, killing is good. He could have said killing was bad. It was completely arbitrary. If he was doing it based on a reason, then we would have to go to the other horn of the dilemma and we'll see why that's problematic as well. So it also makes claims about God's goodness unintelligible. Usually we say somebody is good because they um, do good things. Well, if things are neither good nor bad until God makes them so, then saying he's good is really weird. It's sort of just like God is just picking uh, behaviors like out of a hat to see which is, uh, which is good and which, which is bad and then doing them, but then applying the quality of goodness to God, it, it gets super weird. Um, he would be determining what was good and bad, but saying that he is good or bad is weird. He'd just be sort of like the rule maker, uh, but not subject to the rules. Um, so, uh, the main criticism that I want you to focus on here is that it would make his commands arbitrary. If God this makes things good or bad, not because they're good or bad, but just makes them good or bad, then um, his commands would be arbitrary. Another problem is this conception of morality provides the wrong reasons for moral principles. Imagine if God didn't exist. Well, then child abuse wouldn't be wrong, right? Because on this theory, the only thing that makes child abuse wrong is that God says it's wrong, but no other qualities of the action make it wrong. But it seems perfectly clear that there are good reasons for thinking child abuse is wrong, regardless of uh, God's uh, existence or non-existence. Uh, secondly, and I won't make too much of this, uh, religious texts sometimes disagree, even with themselves. So in that case, God would make something both right and wrong, and that's certainly problematic. All right, so maybe we want to take the other option, the other way of answering this question. Maybe God commands us to do certain things because they're right. So God only picks out actions that are right for us to do, and then commands us to do them, right? So um, he would be making his judgments based on reasons, based on features of actions that make them right or wrong. Um, instead of making them right or wrong, he would just command us to do stuff because he would command us to do the things that are right for other reasons, independent of him making them right or wrong. So, uh, this could be problematic for the theist because we have to abandon then the theological conception of right and wrong. 
if we take this way of answering the question, then God doesn't make things right or wrong. He just is good at recognizing whether things are right or wrong. And there are independent standards uh, that make things right or wrong that anybody could have access to. Um, we need not uh, pour over God's word if, if God is commanding us to do certain things because they're right. We could just look at the reasons that he's looking at, right? Um, so we acknowledge a standard of right and wrong that's independent of God's will. He doesn't make things right or wrong. He just recognizes things as being right or wrong and then tells us um, what we should do. So divine command theory is uh, incredibly problematic. Socrates destroys it with just this one question. Um, and that question, again, is, is conduct right because God commands it? Well, if it's so, then God's commands are ultimately arbitrary because they aren't based on some reason. Or does God command it because it is right? Then there's some independent reason. And then we lose the um, theological conception of right and wrong. And anybody would have access to morality. In other words, uh, if morality depends on religion here, then um, God is arbitrary and could have told us anything is right or wrong. If uh, it doesn't depend on him, um, if morality doesn't depend on religion, then anybody has access to it, right? So either way is going to be unacceptable. So divine command theory is only one religious, of, uh, religious theory of morality that the text covers. The next is natural law theory. So natural law theory says, um, well, it rests on a view of the natural world as having a rational order with built-in values and purposes. Um, er, if you read Aristotle, he would often talk like this, where he'd say things like, um, a knife is made of certain materials and has a certain shape, uh, and its purpose is for cutting things. And the way it is uh, lets us know what its purpose is and how it's to be used. Um, so he would say everything has a purpose, even inanimate objects. And man, according to this view, is the highest end of nature. Um, we talked a little bit about this when we talked about virtue theory. Um, Aristotle's conception of human beings was that they were essentially rational animals and that using our rationality, our reasoning, was our purpose. So that's what we should be doing. So on this theory, um, if something is natural, then it is morally good. If something is unnatural, then it's morally bad. That's how natural law theory in morality goes. So Aristotle conceived it. Uh, Christians like uh, Aquinas and Augustine were very impressed with Aristotle's work, and they just added God into natural law theory and... Uh, that's how uh, Christian morality has been going for a long time. All right, so the theory goes we can derive the way things ought to be from the way things are. So man is a, some examples. Man is a social animal. So if someone does not care about other people, then they're deranged. There's something uh, they're not, uh, they're not, uh, Man is naturally social, so if they don't care, then something's gone wrong. They're not following the natural course of things, and they're um, out of order, <laughs> right? They're out of order and doing something morally wrong. Another example of this is sex is for procreation, so any sex that does not aim at procreation is deviant in a, in a bad way, right? In a pejorative sense. Um, You'll hear natural law theorists say things like this. Of course, if sex is only pro, pro, pro they'll use this to try to say that homosexuality is a sin. Um, of course, as we've talked about earlier in the course, if sex is for procreation and any sex that does not aim at procreation is a sin, well then uh, a woman who is barren or, uh, or a man who um, has... Uh, um, 
sperm issues, then their, uh, then any sex they might engage in would be uh, immoral. And I, I'm pretty sure that a natural law theorist would not want to go that far to those conclusions. All right, so how do we determine right and wrong on a natural law theory? Well, we use our reason because, so Aristotle thought that um, the natural order of things exhibited uh, uh, reason, right? So there were purposes for everything. There was a fitting of means to ends in nature. So we could use our reason to look, perceive what's going on in nature and reason about what that's telling us about how things should be. Um, now, an issue with this theory and how, why it can maybe come apart from religion is believers and non-believers alike can use reason. So um, it doesn't matter if, if you believe in a particular God or not, you could look at nature and see the way natural things were and uh, the way nature worked, what ends it was working towards, and um, determine moral truth quite apart from religion, even if natural law theory is right. So believers have no special access to the truth, and even on natural law theory, you need not be uh, a religious natural law theorist. You could be um, uh, one who didn't emphasize a particular religious tradition. I mean, Aristotle himself was a natural law theorist, though he talked about an unmoved mover. It was only later that Aquinas and Augustine and other thinkers said, ah, he's talking about God. All right, so problems with natural law theory. First of all, it rests on an idea that what is natural is good, but there are obvious counterexamples to that. So um, people, I mean, even religious-minded people are very quick to point out that human beings are selfish and brutal uh, and mean and nasty. Um, well, if that's what's natural for human beings and that's what's good, uh, then... Um, it would seem that we'd be going in the wrong direction with this theory. Um, disease is natural. Uh, disease, if you have to jump through some serious logical hoops to say that disease is a good thing. Um, so this leads us to the recognition uh, that Hume came to long ago that is and ought are logically distinct. Recall at the beginning of this class, I said you need two premises at least to have to come to a moral judgment. You did a statement, a matter of fact, and then a moral principle, and then you need to put them together to come to a moral judgment. You can't just go from the way things are to what should be done. I mean, think about something like brutally torturing and murdering somebody. You can describe that in as much detail as you want, unless you add in a moral principle, you're not going to get to a moral judgment. So you could say um, brutally torturing and murdering somebody hurts that person, causes a whole bunch of pain to that person, it violates their rights, um, it uh, hurts people around them, It's uh, if you're doing it for your own pleasure, it's selfish, all of these things. Unless we have a moral principle that says you ought not do things that are that cause pain, that are selfish, that violate people's rights, then we're not going to get to the conclusion that it's morally wrong. So when we're making moral judgments, we need both a statement of facts and a moral principle. You can't go just from the statement of facts to a moral judgment without that principle. So is and ought are logically distinct. You can't just go from the way things are to the way things ought to be. And finally, this view of the natural world on which natural law theory is based is outdated. So on, in contemporary um, physics and in contemporary natural sciences like physics and chemistry, um, biology, etc., you don't get talk about purposes in nature. You don't get those final causes that Aristotle went on and on about. Um, instead of saying the rain comes down so that plants can be watered, uh, you just get explanation of why it rains in terms of uh, um, condensation and you know 
yada, 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 right? So you just get um, causes leading up to something, but the reason something happens isn't for some purpose. Uh, it just happens because of um, because of small uh, interactions on like molecular level, right? Or bigger ones, but ones that don't have some end in mind, right? So uh, this view of the natural world that it has ends and purposes in mind is outdated and, I mean, if you think about it, insanely anthropocentric. So um, the next part of the text, the next part that the text gets into, it talks about religion and particular moral issues. Are there distinctively religious positions on major moral issues? There's some problems here. It's often difficult to find specific moral guidance in the scriptures. Scriptures and church tradition are often ambiguous, so they'll give us different answers on a question. Um, the the uh, church tradition, uh, the what the church recommends, the doctrine and dogma often evolves. So um, then we're left with, well, this was wrong when the church said it was, and now it's right, or were they mistaken before? It gets... Uh, problematic. So therefore, positions are usually imposed on the scriptures rather than being drawn from them. An example is uh, with abortion. So the scriptures about, uh, if we if we take the, um, the Christian Bible, the scriptures don't say much. There's often a quote invoked in Jeremiah that's taken wildly out of context. Um, so I'll read a little bit here. It's difficult to, to derive a prohibition against abortion from either the Jewish or the Christian scriptures. Certain passages, however, are often quoted by conservatives because they seem to suggest that fetuses have full uh, human status. One of the most frequently cited passages is from the first chapter of Jeremiah, in which Jeremiah quotes God as saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. These words are presented as though they were God's endorsement of the conservative position. It's wrong to kill the unborn because the unborn are consecrated to God. In context, however, these words obviously mean something different. Suppose we read the whole passage in which they occur. Now, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. And the important addition, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I did not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a youth, for to all whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Be not afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. The sanctity of fetal life is not discussed in this passage. Instead, Jeremiah is asserting his authority as a prophet. He is saying, in effect, God authorized me to speak for him. Even though I resisted, he insisted. He pits the point more poetically, saying uh, God had intended him to be a prophet even before he was born. So he's talking about consecrating him as a prophet, not um, as being a human with uh, things like the right to life, etc., etc. Um, the text does a nice job of um, explaining how it's pretty well, how the scriptures can be read to contradict each other. Um, it's pretty clear that Jesus goes on and on and on about how we should dedicate our life to um, improving uh, material and spiritual conditions of those uh, of the poor, of the poor and the struggling. Um, saying, going so far as to say, rich people can't get into heaven. Um, but then there's this obscure passage in the Old Testament where somebody named Jabez prays to God and God increases his holdings. Um, so people sometimes read into that that uh, Christianity is totally compatible with um, accumulating great wealth. Uh, so again, we have people reading into the scriptures what they want to read into them instead of taking out of them what's there. Um, it's also interesting, as the text points out, that we're taking mor moral uh, pointers from a tribe that 
uh, that was writing thousands of years ago, we face very different problems today. So uh, the scriptures, back to abortion, scriptures don't say much about uh, abortion. Church tradition uh, currently says abortion is murder. Um, but if you actually look back, and this was an interesting part of this chapter, if you look back at the history of the church's position on this issue, it wasn't always that life begins at conception. Uh, go back to Aristotle and Aquinas. They thought fetus has acquired a soul when they started to look like a human being. If you've looked at uh, ultrasounds of fetuses, at the beginning they sort of look like a dinosaur. Um, but they start to acquire more human-like features uh, between one and three months of development. Um, and so that's when, at the quickening, I think it's called, when Aristotle and Aquinas thought they acquired the soul, came into them, or they developed the soul. Um, in the 16, and that was the church's official position up until the 1600s. So uh, the church would, at that time, would have been okay with abortion up to this time when the feed, I guess, I don't know what the procedure would be. You look at the ultrasound, think, oh, is that a human? Does that look like a human? And eh, not really. Okay, the abortion is okay. Does it look like a human? Oh, yeah, pretty much. Okay, now the uh, abortion is not okay. That's a pretty... Uh, pretty blurry line at best. In the 1600s, the church, uh, under very, uh, like, behind closed doors uh, meetings for reasoning that's not very clear, the church accepted the idea that a fetus acquires its soul a few days after conception. But note, not at conception. It was a few days after, which um, is also interesting and seemingly arbitrary. Um, we'll talk more about uh, arguments for and against the moral permissibility of abortion next week. Um, this is a bit of a preview and uh, a takedown of the um, religious arguments against the permissibility of abortion. We'll read others, uh, other more interesting, more persuasive arguments against the moral permissibility of abortion and for the permissibility of abortion next week, but uh, the reasoning is unclear here. All right, so what's our take-home message here? Our take-home message here is that um, an adequately grounded moral theory does not depend on uh, religion. It does not depend on the existence of God. Uh, we've talked about many, many moral theories, and we haven't uh, really mentioned much about religion at all up until this point. We've talked about utilitarianism, deontology, virtue ethics. There's also social contract theory, which we've talked about. Um, and you need not mention God to have uh, those theories be legitimate. Um, also, divine command theory is especially problematic. That's the other take-home message here. So, let's get to some quiz questions. Quiz question number one. Which answer should theists find satisfactory to the question, is conduct right because God commands it, or does God command certain conduct because it is right? A is the satisfactory answer that conduct is right because God commands it, or is B the satisfactory answer, God commands specific conduct because it is right? Or C is neither answer satisfactory? Here's question number two. Is this true or false? Christians have always believed that life begins at conception. Is that true or false? All right, thanks for sticking uh, through this. I know it's difficult, especially if you are religious-minded here. You may have married religion and morality. Uh, this chapter has gone a long way towards disentangling the relationship between uh, religion and morality, or at least showing that um, religion is not necessary for uh, an adequate moral theory. Now, there still may be other good independent reasons to believe uh, in the truth of certain um, religious doctrine and dogma, but uh, that it's necessary for morality, it's just not. So, um, thanks for sticking with this. Uh, I'll see you next time.